Hey, what are you guys doing here? Welcome to my channel. I hope you guys enjoy these yama-based practices and remember to hit the subscribe button below. Hey everybody, welcome. Nice to see you all here. So it's very exciting, this whole podcast thing. I don't know how many of you guys have listened to the podcast. If you've listened to it already, uh, can you guys give me a thumbs up as a reaction? Like that? <laughs> yeah, the reaction thing's awesome. That's really great. The podcast is really something that was a passion project of mine to be able to start putting out into our yoga uh, community, this idea of starting to flip the script on passive stretching versus active stretching or dynamic stretching, but also to move away from this idea of flexibility and stretching in the yoga world and kind of bring yoga back to where it's supposed to be. Um, for those of you who haven't heard it yet, uh, the podcast, I just want to give you a very quick recap on it. On the, we've launched the first three episodes, which I'm really excited about. The first episode is, or ask the question, how much flexibility do you really need to have to be happy? Uh, we kind of dive into my own personal history on in yoga. I've been practicing yoga almost since I was 18 years old. And I remember the first time I really hurt my body, I was 18 years old. And I kept thinking to myself, how is this happening to me? <laughs> and then what did I do? I went and stretched even more and really kind of contorted my body into getting all, into all kinds of strange uh, postures. And I always found that stretching made me feel better, but it didn't really solve the problem. I, inevitably, the pain would always come back 24, 48 hours later. And I would always need to stretch more in order to help alleviate the pain. The second episode, we kind of deal with why is stretching hurting you and kind of unpack that a little bit, which is kind of some of the topic I want to talk a little bit about today. And then the science, we get into the science behind stretching and passive stretching versus dynamic stretching in episode three uh, with an expert. I wanted to just quickly ask uh, if anybody who's on here right now, who's listened to any of the episodes, how have you received it? What are your thoughts? Was there any kind of aha moments? Could you relate to my own story? Um, is anybody here want to share anything about what they've heard so far? Please, Carrie, go ahead. Apologies, it took a second to get me unmute. Um, <laughs> That's okay. It was amazing because I realized that the most pain that my hip areas, especially, had been in in my entire yoga journey had been during yoga teacher training. And I was also lifting at the time. I had I've been lifting for six to seven years at that point, and I was having such trouble lifting um, my squat. I it um, I just couldn't carry the weight that I could. I had to take weeks off at a time, and I and it didn't make sense because I thought I'm doing something that's supposed to be giving those joints the most mobility possible and I'm having the most pain. Mm. Uh, and I never would have thought that there was even a connection until I went to the podcast. That's really great. Just out of curiosity, um, what episodes have you listened to so far? I believe I've listened to them all. Oh, great. Awesome. That's really great. And the third one, uh, the third episode, we really kind of unpack why, you know, what is going on biomechanically in your body as you're going through, um, as you're doing these stretches and why there is this instability. So I'm really happy to hear that. I forgot to mention that we've launched the first three, but there's actually five more episodes coming out. 
So stay tuned. There's a lot more coming. <laughs> I'm so happy. So happy. Thank you very much. Thank you. No, I appreciate you uh, chiming in. Does anybody else want to add anything? Yeah, Annette. And it's been a game changer for the way I teach yoga. So a lot, she's using a lot more dynamic stretching rather than passive, and the students are really responding to it well. So thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. I, I kind of say this in the podcast, but I really feel like as yoga teachers, we can really change the narrative in the yoga world if we just eliminate this idea of flexibility and stretching. And we often hear, you know, yoga teachers always saying like, yoga is not about flexibility. But then we turn on Instagram, or even just watch our own yoga teachers at the front of the class. And, you know, there they are putting their foot behind their head. So if it's not about flexibility, then why are you putting your foot behind your head? <laughs> There's like an incongruency, um, as we might want to say. So before I move on, does anybody else want to add anything? Did anybody else listen? Uh, were there any other aha moments? Yeah, I just um, wanted to say I've always struggled with flexibility and had this idea that if I just pushed harder and stretched mm -hmm. harder or longer, that it would somehow fix the problem. And seeing chiropractors, seeing all kinds of uh, physical therapists have always said, you know, you just need to spend more time on the floor stretching. And, um, you know, it, it's never really been successful for me until listening to the podcast and actually just visiting you and even taking one class with you, realizing that my body feels a lot better in mm. movement than it does in stagnation. So nice to hear you, Allie. Thank you for joining yeah. in. <laughs> yeah. Really, really nice. Um, well, that's really great. I really appreciate hearing some of that feedback and it really, it really inspires me more to keep doing this. And it also really makes me happy because one of my, one of my own personal projects, ambitions, purpose drives is to really help other people feel more stable and, uh, more you know, pain free in their bodies. And I believe that, you know, all of us are so, so much called to, to action, especially in this moment right now. I mean, you think about what's going on in the world on so many levels, we don't need to list them all, but, but I think if any of us are going to be agents of change in this world, then doing it from a place of feeling good in my body, not just good after yoga, but like good the next morning when we wake up <laughs> and then the next morning. And that's what really drives me in this. So I wanted just to kind of talk a little bit about today's topic and I'm going to just share a few ideas, a few things. Um, please feel free to jump in and ask questions. Of course, at the end of this little talk, I will also, um, be opening it up to Q and A. So if you have any questions and answers, I do have a few questions that came in um, and then I will address those first and then I'll open it up to everybody. So what is the difference between passive and active and why is this so important? I want to just say something like right off the bat, I really more and more hate the word stretching. I really hate using the word stretching. And when we talk about dynamic stretching, it's really kind of doing a disservice, if you will, to what is actually going on. And we can really debate whether or not there is a stretch going on. Um, some people, even doctors will say, oh no, there's a stretching going on in the muscle. But I don't really feel like it's accurate. So before we talk about dynamic and passive stretching, we first have to discuss this idea of antagonist and agonist muscles because that's where this whole idea of dynamic and passive stretching comes from. So you guys understand this idea. I believe that most of you understand this idea that when you engage a muscle, and so if you look at my big bulging bicep, <laughs> I work out a lot. 
um, that, <laughs> that when my bicep is contracting, the opposite muscle relaxes. Okay, so there's a couple of ways that I can quote unquote stretch my tricep. And one of them is to take my hand here and then push my hand towards my shoulder and that will stretch the tricep. And I can do that passively or I can do that actively. If I do it passively, I bring my hand and push my, my arm, my forearm towards my shoulder and that will stretch the tricep. Um, another way that we can think about it is, you know, we talk about stretching the pectoral muscles. And so some people like bring their arm up to a wall and then push the arm into the wall while they torque their body away. That is passively stretching uh, this area, that's stre passively stretching the pectoral muscles. So this idea of antagonist agonist is kind of important to understand. I'm gonna give you a little demonstration in a moment, bringing it to another area of the body, which I think you'll be able to understand more clearly. When we passively stretch a, a muscle. So if I bring my hand to my shoulder, that's my range of motion right there. And I'm not going to do it, but if I brought my hand here and pushed my wrist or pushed my forearm closer to my shoulder, then that would start to passively move my body beyond its range of motion. And this is where we start to get into trouble. Right now, your brain is connected to different your, your muscles in your body for all intents and purposes. But when we start to passively move the body around, so ergo, if I take my, my forearm to my shoulder using this hand, I'm passively moving the body, all of a sudden, the brain loses the connection to that muscle. And if you ever get a chance to study with me or look at some of the other videos I've put out, there's one video that we, um, webinar that we released and it's, it's available uh, on YouTube. And it's why is stretching hurting you? And that's the title of it. And in there we give a demonstration of actually what happens to someone when they start passively stretching. We get a muscle strong and then we pass, do a passive stretch in that muscle. We stretch that muscle passively, and then we go back and we retest it. And what we find is that that muscle loses all strength. It does not have the capacity to, or capability to contract and contract on demand. What happens is that the brain loses that connection with that muscle. Right now, my brain knows where my bicep is in space. My brain knows, okay, there's a bicep there and is able to contract that bicep. As soon as I start to passively move uh, and force that, that bicep to contract more, or if I do the opposite and start to stretch that bicep out, all of a sudden my brain loses connection to that muscle. And that's really important to just understand that. When you see it, in action, and more to the point, when you feel it in your body, it'll really hopefully change the way that you either practice yoga or if there's teachers here that you teach yoga. And this is why I'm so, so passionate about helping to teach other teachers this idea of dynamic versus passive. As far as I'm concerned, my belief is that we should never teach uh, passive stretching again, <laughs> because when you when you when you practice passive stretching, and you go back out into your life, your brain is not connected to those muscles. If the brain isn't connecting to those muscles, we no longer have stability in the body. So an example of that is like if I'm doing a seated forward bend, and I have a strap and I have it wrapped around my feet, and I'm pulling myself forward. Now I'm starting to bypass all, the whole entire muscular system. The brain disconnects from those muscles. Okay, great. I've gotten more flexibility, but do I have stability? Well, that same person that's doing that pose may stand up. May, it may not happen, but they may stand up and they may bend over and pick something up. Now the brain is not connected to any of the abdominal muscles, the back muscles, 
uh, the hip flexor muscles. So when those muscles are not contracting properly, we no longer have stability in the body. So this is one of the biggest reasons why I'm so passionate about teaching dynamic stretching versus passive stretching. Because when we passively stretch, we automatically start disconnecting the brain uh, to those muscles. Now coming back to this example of I'm bringing my hand cl closer to my shoulder, I'm contracting the bicep, the tricep is relaxing. Now in some jargon, they may say, well, the tricep is stretching. Well, is it stretching or is it just relaxing? See, the, here's the catch-22, and I'm going to give you a demonstration in a moment and talk about a different muscle group. But the tricep, if the tricep is tight, it's tight because it's acting, it's a protective mechanism in the body. The body senses instability, and it sends a message out to the muscles. Contract, 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 contract. <laughs> and what do we do in yoga? Well, we go and violate, and I, I use that word very specifically, we violate the body's uh, protective mechanism. The body is saying, you know, protect itself. There's in instability. We need to tighten up. And what one of the examples I like to give that this is akin to is like, can you imagine, I don't know, you're standing somewhere, you're out shopping, you're looking at the vegetables, you're in the vegetable section. <laughs> I don't know why I picked the vegetable section, but just go with it. You're in the vegetable section and you're looking at the vegetables and then some stranger comes up behind you and wraps their arms around you. What are you gonna do? <laughs> Besides punch them. <laughs> you're gonna tighten up. Your body is going to go inward because you're, you feel unsafe. You're not sure what's going on around you. And what does that stranger do? Oh, they tell you, relax. Relax. Let go. <laughs> Loosen up. And of course, what are you going to do more? You're going to tighten up. And this is exactly what happens when we start to stretch. This is exactly what happens when we're doing yoga and we're going into these postures and we're forcing these tight muscles to let go. They're not wanting to let go. What we actually need to do is address the problem. We need to create stability. So maybe if that stranger, <laughs> instead of coming up and wrapping their arms around you, maybe they could choose a different approach. And likewise, we need to choose a different approach in the body. We need to, instead of saying, addressing the tightness, which is the symptom, let's go to the root cause and start creating more uh, stability. So let me give you the example or show you the example that I'd like to show and talk about for a moment which is about the hamstrings. Just give me one second. So the hamstrings, which is a big one for a lot of people um, to loosen up. So many people deal with tight hamstrings, yes? <laughs> How can I get my hamstrings looser? Well, let's look at the root problem. So if we're talking about opposite muscles here, the opposite muscle to the hamstrings, and there's four hamstrings, by the way. It's important to kind of uh, remember that. There's semimembranosus, semitendinosus, the bicep femoris long head, and short head. The bicep femoris kind of runs on the outside, and then semimem and semitend run on the inside. And it's kind of cool. It's like, well, the short head is, is really small. It starts right here and then connects down here. But the other three are like these three big bands that connect into the ischial tuberosity. And so why are they tight? Well, they're probably tight because the body senses instability. What muscles should be contracting? Well, if we want to get into that, that's we're really looking at the quads and more specifically um, the rectus femoris, which is the big one on the top here. One of the things that kind of worthwhile noting, um, which I think is personally fascinating because I am a hiker, 
I love to hike. I love to be um, in the mountains. And one of the areas of my body that just gets trashed in the past is my knees. It actually started right around the age of 29, 28, 29. And I remember developing this searing uh, knee pain. Well, one of the functions of hamstrings is to begin to flex the knee. The rectus femoris, by the way, which is one of the quad muscles, is actually, its, its function is to extend the knee. But the hamstrings are to flex the knee. Well, what are you doing when you're hiking through the mountains, if you're, especially if you're going up or going down, there's a lot of knee flexion that needs to happen. One of the things that's important to remember is that muscles do two things. They do a few more things, but they primarily do two things. They move bones. <laughs> so if I'm doing this action, it's because there's a muscle contracting, a few muscles contracting that's allowing my, my wrist to come towards my shoulder. The same thing when we're out in the mountains and we're hiking and walking and our muscles are, are moving our body, but they're also supporting the joints of the body. If my hamstrings are not contracting properly, well, what is starting to do that movement? Other muscles. And muscles that should not be doing the job. So as I'm doing this knee flexion, as I'm hiking up the mountain, if these muscles, if my hamstrings are not contracting properly, I no longer have stability in my knee joint. This is a very different idea, by the way, is if you go to a physical therapist. One of the things that physical therapists will often do is go, oh, your muscles are not strong enough, and then they'll give you a series of exercises to strengthen those muscles. What we actually want to do from a Yama perspective is get those muscles activated. And when we talk about activation, we're talking about as a brain, literally, a brain to muscle connection so that the, the, the brain is saying to the muscle, contract, 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 and that muscle is contracting properly. If the brain isn't connecting to that muscle, guess what else happens? The brain tells other muscles to contract, contract, contract. And those muscles usually don't have any business doing what they're, they're to, they don't have any business doing that job. An example of that is if I bend over and pick up something, your back goes out. Well, these muscles in the front body were not contracting, so the brain went to the back body. Hey, you got to support the stability of this body. <laughs> and these little muscles in the lower back shouldn't have been doing the job. And that's why some people's backs go out because little minor muscles started doing the job of other bigger muscles. So coming back to this idea of the hamstring, if I'm bringing my leg up to the sky, what is actually doing that movement? What muscles are moving the leg up? Well, the muscles that are moving the leg up is the rectus femoris, the quads, and some of the other hip flexors. It's got absolutely nothing to do with the hamstrings. But if I can only bring my leg here and my hamstrings start screaming at me, that's because these guys are not contracting properly. So what we want to do is to get these guys contracting in a more effective way. So this is what dynamic stretching or dynamic movement looks like, is just simply bringing the leg up and holding the leg there and then lowering the leg back down. Passive stretching would be to bring the leg up and grab the leg and pull the leg towards me or bring a strap to the foot and start to bring my leg closer uh, to me. So that's passive stretching. That's the difference between passive and dynamic movement. Another example of that would be, and this is how I teach seated forward bends now, sort of the traditional way is to take a strap um, and then pull myself forward or grab my feet and pull myself forward. The way that I teach this now is to bring the hands behind the back and just come forward. Now I'm in my range of motion. Now I'm using these muscles to pull me uh, in. These muscles are contracting as I'm coming forward. 
my upper torso, the front body muscles are also contracting as I'm coming forward. This is dynamic and this is great because now I'm actually working my muscles. It's a very different idea. In the traditional yoga world, if somebody can't come forward, we often say to them, oh, you've got tight hamstrings. Or, oh my, you need to open up your back. <laughs> no, my back does not need to be open. What needs to actually happen is that these muscles need to contract properly. Um, and more importantly, they need to contract, be able to contract and contract uh, on demand. So that's a little bit about the difference between uh, passive and dynamic stretching. What I want to invite you guys to do is to start considering the poses that you're doing and ask where is there an opportunity to be more dynamic as opposed to passive. I'll, I'll show you one other little example because um, this is a typical pose in a lot of yoga classes. So in, in a lot of yoga classes you come and lie down and then you do a supine twist. So you bring the legs all the way over and you leave the opposite shoulder on the ground. Well, that's very passive. I'm letting gravity actually just starting to pull me over and I'm, I'm no longer dynamic or active in my body. So what you wanna do here is maybe instead of coming all the way over, and this is actually how I teach this pose now, is to pull the knees in, pull the pubic bone in, and then just come over halfway or even just one third of the way and keep holding that. Keep pulling the knees towards the opposite armpit and hold it for about six seconds and then come back up and then come back over and hold it for about six seconds and come back up. I wanna just invite you after this webinar, after you finish watching this, Go and do that on your own and see what the difference is. Do one, do, do the passive one first. <laughs> do the passive one first. And when you're finished that, come and stand and just bend over. Then come back down and do the dynamic one. Just come over a third to halfway, really engage through pulling the pubic bone in and do that on both sides. And then after you're finished, come and stand up and do it again and bend over and just see what the difference is. You will notice a huge change in your body. You'll notice that these muscles feel, feel very different and also feel uh, enlivened here. Okay, so that's a little bit about passive versus dynamic uh, stretching. And that's a little bit to understand that when you're talking about dynamic stretching, if you want to use that word, I prefer to use dynamic movement. But if you're going to do something dynamically, what we're really asking is what muscles are able to contract, what muscles should be contracting, and then contracting uh, on demand. So I also want to just kind of add another point here. And some of you I know are yoga teachers, and some of you take uh, classes with other teachers. And you do hear this word engage. And I've spoken to many teachers <laughs> over the last uh, few years. And many of them have actually said to me, uh, oh no, I do teach muscle engagement. I'm always telling my students to engage their muscles. Yeah, you can't be stretching <laughs> and doing certain postures and holding that engagement. It might be a nice idea in your mind. Um, it might be a nice uh, feeling to cultivate. We call that a bhavana in yoga sometimes. But it's biomechanically, it's not happening. It's not happening at all. And the most interesting thing is if we actually go in and test those muscles, most of the time they're going to test weak. Uh, I had this one student of mine in, in one of my previous trainings uh, back in April, really serious workout kind of person. Um, he always incessant about working out. Um, he was really in shape, an ex-army guy, uh, but he also loved to stretch. And he was always saying to me, well, what if I do this pose? What if I do that pose? 
And I would say to him, well, you know, do this pose, go do this pose and let's come over and test to see if that muscle is strong. It always tested weak. Actually, it was really, it not only tested weak, sometimes he could barely move certain body parts because those muscles in that moment were not able to contract and contract on demand. And you could literally visually see uh, the muscle weakness. So I, I just wanted to put that out there. You going to yoga class and the teacher saying to you, well, engage this muscle while you're in this stretch is not necessarily going to engage the muscle. And that's not really what we're talking about here. If we're going to use um, the body in a very sensible uh, and mechanical way, then we wanna take out the opportunity for any kind of passive movement. So I have a few little tips here, um, especially for yoga teachers and how you can make a change. I know that there's a few uh, teachers here. One of the things that I would invite you to do is at the top of the list is commit to never using the word stretching and flexibility again. <laughs> just practice eliminating those words wherever you can um, because they're just not useful. And I, I can't, say this often enough that in the yoga scriptures, there is no mention of flexibility or stretching. It really is an invention that came out of sort of this Western uh, fitness culture, if you will. But in the yoga scriptures, there's absolutely no words mentioned of flexibility and stretching. Um, if a person is coming in pain, uh, the, Stretching is always going to exacerbate the pain. So just something to keep in mind that if you do have a student coming to you with pain and you say like, for example, in their shoulder, oh my goodness, shoulder problems are an epidemic in the yoga world, <laughs> which is a whole other webinar. But a lot of times people, and I've been a victim of this, um, you get this searing pain in your shoulder and you just like, bring your arm up to a wall and you're stretching it, or maybe you bring it to the floor and you stretch it. You do feel good in the moment. There's no doubt that stretching does have an effect on the nervous system. Um, it actually will start to distract the brain. It's really, uh, really falls underneath the law of distraction. You're distracting the brain from the pain because you're creating another situation. But once the body resolves that other situation that you're creating, it will go back to feeling the pain again, which is, and sometimes the stretching actually will exacerbate the pain. Uh, this is a big one for yoga teachers. I really encourage yoga teachers to stop demonstrating poses. Personally, I always use students um, to demonstrate. And I usually will always pick um, the least mobile uh, student in the class, sometimes the most newest student in the class, because I think that if they can feel like they're doing the pose their way and other people see them doing the pose, it gives permission for people to feel okay with where they're at. And um, I feel like it creates more inclusivity. But at the very least, stop demonstrating poses. I ne this never became more clear to me when I was doing some editing of a class of another teacher and I was watching her teach the class and she said, okay, everybody, we're gonna come into Baddha Konasana, seated forward bend. And she said, just listen to your body, just go to your own, you know, um, go as far as you're comfortable going. Well, what did she do? She grabbed her feet and pulled, not just her forehead to her feet, but her whole chest. <laughs> And that was like a huge wake up call for me. I watched that and I thought to myself, this is one of the biggest incongruencies in the yoga world that a yoga teacher says one thing, but then does the complete opposite. So I really encourage yoga teachers to not demonstrate poses and to use students um, if they really must. Always use, this is the next one, always use a few Ayama stabilization poses in your classes. So find different, I call them muscle activation postures, but find a few different muscle activation postures that you can weave into your class. My two favorite ones is bridge pose 
And my second favorite one is Shalabhasana, which is sometimes translated as Superman pose. So with bridge pose, you bring the arms up to the sides and you lift your hips up and focus on squeezing the glutes. This will start to activate the glutes and even some of the small muscles in the lower back. And then Shalabhasana, Superman pose, where you lift the chest and the legs off the floor. And that really starts to target the major muscle groups in the lower back, the longissimus, the multifidus, the iliocostalis. Those are the key stabilizer muscles in the back. So those are just two postures. There's a, many others um, that you can start to learn uh, in, in many of the videos that I've been putting out, but find different poses that you can put into your class and weave them in um, as a way to create more stability. One of the questions I always ask myself in every yoga class, even more so now is, how is my student leaving more stable? And if they're more stable, they're gonna be pain-free. And if they're pain-free, they're gonna leave this class and be more in purpose in their life and do amazing things. So asking that question, how can they leave more stable is so important. Um, and this kind of leads to the fifth point is just the, the purpose of yoga if we really want to get scriptural, if we want to look to the yoga scriptures, is to get stable. Stable. Without stability, we have absolutely nothing. And this relates to um, stability in mind, stability in breath, which I think that yoga teachers do a pretty good job of. Where we need to work on a little bit more is stability in body. And part of that stability in body from an ayama perspective means how can we get the muscular system activated? How can we get the muscular system more connected to the brain so that when we're going back out in life and we're doing our daily things, that our muscles are able to contract and contract on demand. One of the things I did just the other day is I went for a 12 kilometer hike up in the mountains 10 years ago, if I had done that, even probably eight years ago, I would have finished that hike and been barely able to walk. I would have gotten in my car, drove home, got out of my car, and all of a sudden felt my back, my knees would have been screaming at me. But these days I don't deal with that anymore and I'm much older than I was eight years ago. <laughs> um, I don't deal with that stuff anymore because when I'm out there hiking, my body is doing, my muscles are doing what they should be doing. And that is really because of a lot of the yama practices that I do on a daily basis. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I really believe that we need to help people become pain-free and to have a muscular system that's functioning properly. And I believe that, excuse me, now more than ever, especially with everything that's going on in the world, if we really wanna be agents of change, we need to make sure that our home is stable and strong and powerful. So I wanted to just open it up to the floor um, for some FAQs. I have a few here, but I'd like to just find out first if anybody here has a question and wants to jump in. Nobody wants to ask a question? <laughs> okay. Well, I do have a couple here. And if you do have one, just kind of uh, use the emoji to give a thumbs up and I'll let you ask the next question. But one of the questions that I have um, often get is, what if I wanna teach passive stretching? Is it a good idea? So I gave an example of dynamic stretching or what I like to call dynamic movement um, or activation versus passive. I, you, you know, it's time and time again, when we, when I've had people ask me this question and I ask them, okay, we'll do a passive stretch. Let's go test the muscles and see what's happening. Every single time they test weak. And so what I would just say that if you're going to teach passive stretching, just know that you're going to leave students vulnerable. Students will be open and vulnerable to injury. And it may not be that day, it could be down the road, but definitely you're leaving them vulnerable and open to injury. So that's my two cents about 
if you really want to teach passive stretching. But then one of the other questions I often get is, if I must teach it, if I am going to teach passive stretching because I just really want to do it, um, when is the best time to teach it? Well, I have kind of two answers for this. Um, if you're going to set up a class and you're going to do some passive stretching, and, and I will admit there are some uh, poses that I will do um, that are more passive um, or definitely have a passive quality. One of them is fish pose, lying back on blocks. I love that pose. Um, it just feels really good. And if you do it in such a way, it actually doesn't create too much stress on the body. It can actually be really great. But <laughs> here's the caveat. If I'm going to teach a passive pose like fish pose uh, with blocks, it's always at the beginning of the practice. It's never at the end. So I always start with a passive. If I am going to teach a passive pose, I always put it at the beginning. One of the poses, another example is, is child's pose. Like so many teachers love child's pose. And so if we're gonna put a pose like that into our class, do it at the beginning of the class. Um, and then don't, don't do any more passive stretching at, um, in the, in, throughout the class. Another idea is, is like some people are really addicted to this kind of yin thing. And, and so if you're going to do a yin kind of practice, if you must, um, then do it at nighttime. Do it before you go to bed because where are you gonna go after that practice? You're not gonna go up hiking, <laughs> you're gonna go to bed. <laughs> so do a kind of, if you're gonna do a very passive kind of practice, do it before you go to bed so that way your body can recuperate and the brain can start to reconnect to some of those muscles, if you must. Uh, we just had a question uh, typed out here. Aaron, so do you have a whole routine, a complete muscle activation uh, poses uh, that one can do every day or a few times a week? Well, the first way I'm going to answer that question is by just saying, if you can commit to doing at least eight minutes a day, it's a game changer. Um, so I'm 50 now, and I always keep telling myself, Aaron, make sure you get your eight minutes in today because your 70-year-old self will thank you or your 80-year-old self will thank you. <laughs> so just if you can just do a little bit every day, it will be a game changer in, in your body because a lot of us, and I'm going to use the glutes right now as an example, a lot of us are walking around with weak glutes. And we're walking around with glutes that are not contracting properly. And, and I can prove this point because if any of you guys go out and you go for a long walk, um, maybe you go shopping with your friends and spend the day at the mall or wherever. And, <clears throat> and, you, and you're, what happens after a while is your lower back starts to ache. Why is it starting to ache? Because your glutes aren't working properly. Your glutes aren't working, and there's probably a few other muscles that are also not working properly, but the glutes are not working. They're one of the primary muscles. And once you start getting those guys working and they start working properly and they get stronger, then you'll be walking around for hours and you won't have that ache in your back anymore because the big muscles are doing their job properly. Uh, I have a lot of different routines. I'm actually starting to put out a lot of content. Um, you can find a lot of great classes in the membership site, which you guys um, all can get access to. You guys get three months. Um, so I definitely would recommend checking that out, especially the muscle activation classes. I'm also committed to putting out about eight uh, videos a month right now, talking about different things, um, giving different hacks for different muscle groups, which are basically muscle activation practices that you can start to integrate and weave into your yoga practices. And I also have uh, 60 and 75 minute and 90 minute uh, full on uh, practices that integrate um, the Ayama practices into them. So I hope that it helped answer your question, but absolutely, yeah, do, do as much as you can, but if you don't have a lot of time, just like I said, eight minutes a day, it's a game changer. 
One of the uh, courses that I have in the membership site is the runner's course. And in the runner's course, I go through a list of muscles. I talk about those muscles and I, and I show you exercises for each of those muscles. But the big gift of that course is that there's three practices in there. And each of those practices are about eight to 10 minutes. And so you just got to plug one of those in and do them every day. You can rotate them so they get, you know, so you don't get bored of them. But those eight to 10 minutes cover like so many different muscle groups and start to turn them on. If you can do that every day, woo, <laughs> it'll be a game changer. So check out that course, the runner's course. Um, and I call it the runner's course, but it, it's really for everybody. Uh, please feel free to jump in and, uh, as I said earlier, just to ask questions. This is an FAQ time. Um, what are one of the other questions that we often get is, what are some of the worst poses to teach, and are there any that we should stay away from? <laughs> um, there is definitely a few. I am not a fan of hip openers anymore, and. I just wanted to show you guys something that if you're gonna be doing hip openers, this is kind of interesting. We're talking about range of motion earlier and we're talking about range of motion. Like this is as far as I can bring my knee into my chest. Now I can take my hands on my knee and pull my knee closer, but now I'm starting to bypass the body's natural range of motion. So I'm not a fan of hip openers. Another example would be like, if I bring my foot towards my ear. Now, this is a very typical pose in a lot of yoga classes. We wrap our arms around this leg and then pull the leg into my chest. And I can actually get a lot more range of motion if I passively pull my leg in. That's not a problem. But guess what happens? all the muscles and the glutes shut off and I no longer have stability. All of the hip rotators also get really overstretched. So I'm not a fan of hip openers. And to be quite honest with you, one of the questions that I've been asking for the last two years is, what does hip opening really even mean? And why do we even need to open the hips? I think answer that question first and what you might come up with or what you might arrive at is instead of opening my hips, maybe I need to get those muscles stronger. What would it be like if those muscles um, could get stronger? Okay, so another question that just came in, um, I've been doing that runner series and has made a huge difference. Ah, <laughs> you're very welcome. Thank you for saying that, I appreciate it. That's awesome. Um, it, it's a great little routine. It's, I do those, I rotate through a lot of those exercises every single day. Um, and if I don't, I really start to feel it in my body. <laughs> um, and then one of the other questions that I wanted to kind of address um, that came in was how do I teach poses more safely? This is a hard one because it, it does demand a paradigm shift. What I would say right off the bat is look at where gravity is pulling you into a pose. Anytime we start to use gravity um, or, or an outside force to pull us into a pose, we're starting to create more of a passive action. Challenge yourself to start analyzing a pose and thinking about it in terms of of looking at it through that lens. I can't, I don't have enough space here to do it, um, but if you can imagine pyramid pose, you're standing up, one foot is forward, the other foot is behind, and you bring your hands to your waist and start to come forward over the leg that's forward. Pyramid pose, partial tanasana. Well, a lot of people, when they come forward, they reach forward and bring their hands to blocks or they bring their hands to the floor and that starts to become more passive if we want to make it more active keep the hands on the hips or bring the hands behind the back and keep the spine extended and only come as forward fall far forward as you can 
without losing that extension in the spine. And that will start to bring it, make it more dynamic, if you will. Ask yourself as you're either practicing yoga or as you're doing postures, how can you start to become more dynamic? And I'm not talking about, again, engaging muscles. It's got nothing to do with you going, okay, tighten the muscles, tighten the muscles, but more, how are those muscles starting to shorten and how can you respect your body's own range of motion? If you're lying on the back and coming back to that lying twist that I showed you, the typical methodology in a lot of yoga classes is just bring the knees over and let the knees kind of fall over to the side. Well, that's not your natural range of motion. Um, so you're starting to use gravity to let the knees come down, to pull the knees down to the floor. See where there's an opportunity to put the brakes on and, and actually use your muscles to hold the knees there in space as I, as I showed you earlier in the demonstration. And think, kind of apply that same methodology to all yoga postures. Um, there's another question from Ali. Are there any exercises that do not pair well with yoga or counteract the progress made through yoga? <laughs> um, so, I was actually thinking about certain yoga postures. Um, one, of the, one of the postures I'm not a fan of anymore is child's pose. I think that pose is so counterintuitive to what we try to do, especially from an ayama perspective in activating the body. Um, but in terms of outside um, exercises like a stationary bike, I have to really think about that. There's, you know, if my teacher Greg was here, Greg is the creator of muscle activation technique and who I've been studying with for the last few years in that methodology and starting to apply it into the yoga world. But if he was here, he would say nothing is bad or good. And I know that's such a, a cliche kind of thing to say, but from a physiological standpoint, it's very true. What's going to make me stronger and actually help my neuromuscular system may not help you. So we have to really kind of pay attention to that. Is this thing that I'm doing making me stronger? Um, one of the examples that Greg would often give is somebody who goes and works out for the first time in a long time and then just starts benching 150 pounds. If I went to the gym right now and started benching 150 pounds, <laughs> I'm laughing at myself, um, then that would actually be more unproductive for my body. That would create more stress and probably ensue trauma and overuse in my body. Now, if I went to the gym and started benching maybe 50 pounds and focused a lot on flies to get my pecs activating properly, then that might actually be more useful. And that probably would be more beneficial to me. So it's kind of a hard question to answer. If for me, hiking is great, but if, if, if I brought somebody that hadn't walked to the end of their driveway and back um, in the last five or six years, then that might not be a good thing for them to go on a 12 kilometer hike with me. Um, what I would say to you is, and this is what one of the directions I give to a lot of people in my trainings, whatever exercise you're going to do, if it's going to be on a stationary bike, if you're going to go to CrossFit, I'm a huge CrossFit junkie. But one of the things that you have to do or that you, you try to do before you go and do these things, do some muscle activation practices. Make sure that the main muscle groups are activated. In the runner's course, I go through a lot of those major muscle groups um, that you can start to pay attention to. And I give you the drills and the exercises for each of those muscle groups. But make sure those major muscle groups are working and they're working well before you go and do those exercises. You wanna make sure that your brain is connecting to those muscles so that when you bend down and you pick up the barbell, your brain is saying to all of the, the trunk muscles, like contract, contract, contract. Um, if you're gonna get on a stationary bike, that your brain is connected to the rectus femoris, your quads, 
and saying contract, contract, contract. Uh, so that's my two cents there <laughs> about that. Um, Aaron, this is um, if this is pertinent, are all teachers at Blue Osa adept in Ayama? Um, it's Ayama, <laughs> and, or is this specifically only taught at your yoga teacher classes? I, a lot of our teachers, our guest teachers are not adept in it. So a lot of people that come to Blue Osa bring their own yoga groups. It's something that I'm offering in our yoga teacher trainings. It's a big core part of the 200 and 300 hour teacher trainings. And it's something that I'm starting to work on in, in finding uh, collaborations and alliances with different studios um, around America. My goal is to have a base of Ayama practices in each um, city all over the world, hopefully. That's my big goal. I, again, thank you so much for joining and I'm really, really, really happy to have this opportunity. We're gonna be holding these Q and A's every month. Uh, the next podcast, I believe will re be released on July 13th. And the topic of that particular podcast is what is Ayama? And what are some practices in a yama that you can actually start to do to help your body? And then we're going to be having another Q&A right after that. So again, thank you guys so much for joining in. And I look forward to hopefully seeing you next month. Have a great day, everybody.